Welcome to the Nonprofit Exchange, stories by leaders for leaders to help you to raise the bar on your own performance and to release the potential inside of you. Now, here's today's episode. Greetings, everyone. It's Hugh Ballou back for another exciting session of the Nonprofit Exchange. You can find us by going to the Nonprofit Exchange, the nonprofitexchange.org. Um, and today's episode is hmm, first one I remember in seven years about this specific topic. And we have a lovely guest today who's very experienced, experienced and passionate about her work. So Diana Zhang, welcome to the Nonprofit Exchange. Tell people a little bit about you and your passion for the work that you're doing. Absolutely. So first of all, Hugh, thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited for this conversation and so excited to, to get to hopefully provide some, some helpful insights for, for your audience. Um, in terms of a bit of information about me, um, first and foremost, I always like to introduce myself as I'm a mom. So shout out to my five-year-old Lily and my, my almost three-year-old Teddy. Um, in, my, in my normal day job, as I like to describe it, um, I'm actually a 15-year executive at a global hedge fund based out here in Connecticut. And, you know, I've run everything from our investment research department to our corporate real estate to our firm's various talent programs. Um, and, you know, by way of background, I've just been extensively trained basically to build teams and organizations right from the ground up and and figure out how to get big things done via others. Um, and, uh, you know, it's and then my latest gig, which is why we're here to talk today. It's been a really wonderful and educational experience to get to translate that skill set I've built in the finance space into what I'm doing these days, which is something completely different, which, you know, today you find me as the co-founder and CEO of NeighborShare, which is a startup nonprofit that, um, you know, is really targeted toward empowering our community's frontline heroes to get our neighbors the help they need when they need it. Um, and, you know, in terms of describing my passion, I love the way you phrase that, Hugh, you know, like, I think there's a couple of key reasons why I'm doing this work. Um, you know, first and foremost, I really, really deeply believe in our mission and think it's incredibly important. You know, we, we started NeighborShare, my co-founder and I, and our initial founding team of volunteers, you know, we started this whole effort in the midst of the pandemic. And we started with a very urgent question around how can we get direct help? to the people who need it the most in our communities when we need it, right? And so, and so sort of like the more I dug into the space, the more I sort of like became to viscerally understand um, sort of the devastating statistics out there, right? One of our filing cries is that Federal Reserve statistic that, you know, 40% of Americans can't afford a foreign dollar emergency. <laughs> the more I just became passionate about, hey, let's create an innovative solution that can act as an extra layer of safety net. Right, to really supplement the really wonderful work that all the other existing nonprofits are already doing. So in my mind, it's a supplementation and, and an extra resource so that we can all really come together and collaborate to help our communities. Um, and then I would say, you know, secondly, the other key reason why I'm doing this work is that, you know, look, like, I frankly also really love the, um, the intellectual and visceral challenge of what it means to build and run a nonprofit. Right. Um, you know, I've probably grown a lot more gray hairs these um, these past, you know, but this past year, 12 to 18 months than than I have before where like, geez, it's it's hard. Um, it's you know, you're you run into roadblocks all the time, et cetera. But wow, it's satisfying. Right. Like anytime you crack through a problem, you end up with that much more progress toward helping another neighbor, toward helping another community member. And and that's what keeps me going. It's sort of like the the little engine that just keeps on keeps on driving and hopefully compounding through time so that we can help more folks through time. Whoa, that's that's exciting to hear hear you talk about it, and you talk about it with the great passion that's behind your work. So your specialty is developing uh, high performing teams, and um, so you started this nonprofit, right? Yes, I I, I co founded it with uh, with one of my good friends. That's right. Great. Um, so so <clears throat> what? There's a gap when we start a new enterprise we're filling a gap in the market. We're filling a gap that people need something. So what was the big gap that you're filling and what's unique about how you do it? Yeah, no, great question. So, yeah. you know, I, as I mentioned earlier, you know, we really started this whole effort, um, you know, with that key question of how do we get direct help to the people who need it the most in our communities, right? And then not just to the people who need it, but when they need it, right? And almost like this sort of like real time sense. 
And, you know, as we, we dug into that, you know, we realized that it's actually pretty hard to figure out who in your communities need help in that particular moment. Right. Sort of like if you thought of like it from the perspective of the typical donor. Right. And I totally was that typical donor like 18 months ago. Right. I can't actually just walk down the street in my neighborhood and be able to identify which neighbor needs a little bit of a helping hand, a little bit of a bridge to help make ends meet in that particular moment. Right. And so what we um, what we ended up deciding to experiment with, and this is the model we've built out since then, is, you know, like we, we have the insight of like, why not go empower the population who does already know? and figure out a way to sort of give them a new tool to be able to provide resources to those neighbors on the ground. And so ultimately what NeighborShare does is we basically partner with what we call our community's frontline heroes, which I think is a lot of your audience today, right? Sort of, it's the nonprofit leaders and their frontline staff, their case managers, their social workers, could be teachers at schools. Over time, you can almost imagine us partnering with nurses at hospitals. But basically we went and partnered with the folks who walked you know, closely with our communities and already had that intimate pulse on need in our communities and we're already doing the hard work of providing them a lot of resources, right? But the re unfortunate reality on the ground is that despite all the effort, despite all the different things that come together, there's always needs that slip through the cracks. And so that's where NeighborShare comes in, right? Where we partner with those frontline heroes and we give them a very easy way to basically spotlight what we call these pivotal needs of $400 or less that they've run out of resources for. Right. It's either out of scope or out of funding or whatever it is. And we give them a way to, to spotlight these individual validated needs on our platform at mbshare.org. And then it's really on neighbor shares then to then work to bring in the donors, et cetera, to, to be able to fill those needs and ultimately get those funds distributed back directly to that neighbor that was identified on the ground. And so that's sort of how our whole whole ecosystem works. She ran that by fast. It's in like a neighbor B, neighbor in B, neighbor share nbshare.org. You can find out about uh, their work there. So <clears throat> what's some of the biggest problems that leaders face in dealing with this big sector that want to do stuff, but sometimes we're in the way of letting them do it? We call that volunteer. So what's the biggest mistake that we as leaders make? Um, in the, and you're saying in the volunteer space? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think it's, um, and it's interesting because I've, I've made some of them myself. I think it's like a couple of things where, um, and this is a point that even you made, Hugh, when we were, we were talking earlier, where one, um, it's like one mistake is thinking too narrowly about the role that volunteers can play in our organizations, right? By even calling them such, like it's sort of like you, you might automatically think about them in this like narrow task oriented, like they can only do a certain thing. Right. Versus the way I, I, my co-founder ended up building out this organization is really, you know, building out a truly volunteer run and volunteer built organization where, you know, our volunteers come in really as capital O owners of the organization with us. Right. So we give them the creative space and the responsibility and almost the burden of like, you know, you're coming in and joining our organization and really building this with us. Right. So that's like, I think, point number one, which is how do you really um empower your volunteers to take on more not less and it's an interesting thing where i found that it's almost like a psychology thing the more you give a person to own and give them space to create and experiment and fail and try again the more into it they'll become right they don't become disenfranchised they become they become owners of the challenge with you right so i think that's point number one um and then i think another piece is really then thinking through how do you just um, engage your volunteers and nurture community in like an ongoing way Right. Sort of like, you know, the the cons, of course, of, of using a largely volunteer run organization is that, look, our nonprofit, unfortunately, will never be their top priority. <laughs> right. We're always third, fourth, fifth on the list. Right? They have day job, they have their family, they have life, et cetera. And they're like, oh, nice, 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 nice problem. Let me now work on neighborship. Right. And so sort of like, even though I'm living and breathing neighbor share with 125 percent of my time, I also need to think about how do I bring sort of my volunteer team in with me so that they're feeling the excitement and the grind and the challenges and the successes and the failures on the ground with me, even though they might not be necessarily living and breathing it every single day with me. Right. But how do you create that experience so they just feel as close to it with you as possible? And then once again, how do you share that capital O ownership? Right. So that they want to keep on building with you. And you, you earlier referenced the fact that you had made some of the mistakes. I think if we don't acknowledge we've done that, we're, we're, we're clueless. 
Um, and as a matter of fact, I do claim the, the title of expert because I've made all the mistakes more than once. <laughs> there we so, go. <laughs> so I've, that's I've, how we I've, become experts. <laughs> yes, ma'am. It's that's a learning opportunity is what it is. So you've built this nonprofit up from scratch. So what are some of the challenges you've had? And what would you share with people about your experience that they could learn from? Yeah, I mean, it's it's so funny. I get this question a lot in terms of, hey, you know, building this organization from scratch, what are the biggest challenges? And I kind of laugh because I'm like, what hasn't been a challenge, right? Because like, this is hard, right? It's sort of like, you know, much respect to your audience out there who are literally out there building and running nonprofits. And, you know, like just like stepping back a bit broadly from the volunteer topic for a second, as I think through some of the biggest challenges, you know, I think it's been everything from, you know, like what does it mean to effectively introduce a new and somewhat disruptive model into the nonprofit space, right? You know, I think, you know, when we first started NeighborShare, I think I was kind of naively thinking about the, hey, like, we're not here to be disruptive. We just thought it'd be like an interesting new resource that we can just provide to nonprofit teams and leaders out there um, in the spirit of like, let's just figure out more ways to help our neighbors on the ground, right? And then what I came to appreciate is that, oh geez, the, the model that we're proposing actually is fairly disruptive, right? It's not the way our, our nonprofit partners on the ground are designed and the traditional nonprofits are set up. And so how do we develop that deep empathy to better understand the partners we're trying to attract and bring on to our platform? And how do we really break through and really be able to show and share um, and make more visceral sort of like the value we're working to bring with this idea? And then how do we do it in a way that's sort of as seamless and as weightless and as overhead like you know light as possible for our partners right so that we're all value add and not distract detracting from all the really um important work that they're doing so, so that was like a big challenge in terms of how do you even break into the space in the first part right i have a whole list of other ones but we can pause there for a second <laughs> sure 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 um so when you started how did you attract your volunteers yeah that's a that's a great question i um you know, and, and it's interesting because the, the way I found it always works is that like the first step is almost always the easiest because you just call up your good friends and stuff, right? And then it's like, oh, you get a couple people working, you get going, et cetera. The harder part becomes how do you then keep on building that team? How do you keep on sustaining it as you go through turnover, et cetera, right? And so, you know, the way I think about um, attracting volunteer talent now in a much more sort of ongoing way, right, as we continue building and growing and replenishing talent, who needs to roll off and whatever, is that, you know, and like, and I think this is true for any employer, like regardless of whether you're for profit and nonprofit, is that, you know, like we got really clear and crisp about what our value proposition was for our volunteers, AKA our employees, right? Um, you know, like I really think of it as like re we're recruiting, right? And you're recruiting to fill a role and that's a bit like dating, <laughs> right? Where both sides need to feel that click and both sides need to basically get something out of the relationship for it to work well. Right. And so I think I think sort of like the key, like a key first step is to think deeply about what value, value proposition you're bringing to a potential volunteer. And then, of course, then you want to market it well. And then, you know, to bring it down to a more tangible example, you know, I think at, at NeighborShare, you know, we sort of our value proposition is threefold. Right. Like first and foremost, is of course, the social impact mission. Right. Like no volunteer is going to work with us unless they believe in the cause that we're working on and the type of impact we're trying to make in our communities. And then every nonprofit out there is going to have their mission. Right. But in addition to that, you know, that the second part of our value prop is, that, you know, like we're really looking to give our volunteers a real opportunity to join an entrepreneurial adventure. Right. And build something from the ground up. Right. And so for those folks that you're speaking with who sort of like have their day jobs that sort of have that startup itch and want to do something experimental and startup, et cetera, like we help them scratch that itch. Right. And it ends up becoming like a really great sort of like developmental growth opportunity for them professionally, actually. Right. Where we're saying, hey, person X, you already have this expert skill set from your day job. Now apply it over here in NeighborShare, but do it one or two levels up from your org. Because guess what? We're scrappy or whatever. Like if you're, you know, an associate, go operate at a VP level with us. You're still more, no more than I do. Right? It's a lot of value. Come and experiment. Right? So we give them white space to grow and be true entrepreneurs. Once they think that becomes a really attractive value pop for the right person. And then, you know, I think last but not least is, is the thing I mentioned earlier, which is the like, you know, we work really hard and explicitly to provide a really great community and network. Right. You know, it's sort of it's, um, you know, in addition to just having a team that's comprised of, you know, good people doing good work, they, you know, the volunteers themselves also happen to be like a really um, accomplished group. 
right? And so via the power of the NeighborShare network alone, people help each other out. We pay it forward, right? Sort of like we help folks get jobs. We, you know, I've done probably more graduate school recommendations like this year alone than previous ones or whatever. Like you, you offer to help each other out, right? In terms of providing them both that tangible development experience, progress their day jobs even, and then also literally helping them when they're, you know, in search of the next job and whatever else. Um, and so that's been sort of like a key, sort of key strategy, I think, behind how we attract great talent. That's great. That's great. The, um, I'm, I'm going to go back to the creating uh, an opportunity to have buy-in, but I'm also want to connect that with people that, that apply. And it, if I'm using it carefully because that term carefully, because you said it's like they are non-salary, non-compensated employees. Actually, <clears throat> in some organizations I've worked with, we call them servant leaders. They have a channel that they're leading and they serve yes. for the greater good, not for money. And so there's, a, there's this whole philosophy of serving. Um, so you've, you've got this culture of high performance, how do you then attract people with those kinds of principles and then engage them like you would an employee at that high standard and then create a program of work and let them do the work? So there's several places that we as nonprofit leaders, we think, oh, they're a volunteer. We have to set any low standard and they're going to show up sometimes and it doesn't matter. So we kind of set the bar for failure. So how do you set the bar higher for success? I think that's such an important and insightful point, Hugh, because, um, it, you know, in my opinion, excellence begets excellence and good talent attracts other good talent, right? It compounds. So to your point, if you're starting off on the like, oh, they're volunteers at the low bar, you've already shot yourself in the foot before you've gotten going, right? Versus planting the right seeds so that you can grow the tree later, right? And so on our end, you know, I really think about the way we maintain the high standards, it's it's really about setting um, clear expectations up front, right? Like once again, when I, when I meet a prospective volunteer, I think of them as a prospective employee, right? Like take away the volunteer piece and I can't pay you piece and all that out of the window for a second. It's like, no, we're building a very important organization with an important mission and the quality of our work needs to be high because our neighbors depend on it, right? And so when I, when I meet a prospective volunteer, we have a very clear conversation where I'm like very upfront about the, hey, by the way, this isn't your typical volunteer gig, right? It's not like you get to come in, you do an hour worth of work, you feel good about it, you pat your shoulders and you leave. It's like, no, when you're coming in, you're taking on real responsibility, right? You're going to have a CEO who's going to hold you accountable. I'm going to be empathetic. I'm going to be flexible. We're, of course, recognize it. But like, I'm giving them a challenge and I'm giving them the chance to opt out if they don't want to sign up for that challenge. And because that's okay, I'm not going to judge you if you're like, oh, I'm too busy to do this or whatever, that's fine. But you vet them up front and you're just really clear on like, do you want to be a builder with us, right? And more than, like, more than anything, people are way more excited about that. Like, oh, whoa, this is different. Like, I didn't know I get to really be part of building a startup, right? Not just, you know, the, the volunteer thing. And so I think, I think that's really important. And then, you know, and then we vet for, like, I think our key guidepost is once again, it's just like, it's just, you want good people doing good work, right? You want high capability, you want high humility, right? We have a no jerks rule <laughs> and we have a no slackers rule, right? Like no one's gonna be here to like babysit you or micromanage you. Like if you're gonna sign up for something, you deliver it, right? And so that's, and then, and that's like, by the way, these are the exact things I'd be saying to my team and my, my for-profit job, right? It's sort of like, I think the more you can just hold that bar and not just say, oh, but I can't pay them. And oh, it's just volunteers. The more it's like, no, this is your team. You're running your organization. I think the more you can get yourself in that mode as the leader, the more your people will follow and get it and love it because you're like, yeah, I'm part of something real, right? I'm ready to sign up. <laughs> Come and join, we can always use help. <laughs> so you've created the, 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 the ask that's profound Yes, I want to be part of this high-performing team. Nobody wants to show up and do a bad job. Right, right. However, leaders continually, you know, I can't tell you how many times in my life people said, oh, I need you to be on this committee. Don't worry, it's not much work. We just want you to show up. Right there, they're apologizing for asking and setting low expectations. And you know they're lying because there is work to do. Yes. But, but we have this 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 mindset that we're asking people to do us a favor. So would you speak to that mindset, please? Yeah, I mean, I think it's once again that notion of like 
think of it as um as it's just like dating right where both sides need to bring something to the table and so i think the way you position yourself isn't the like hey i'm asking you the favor etc is you're helping contribute and i'm also doing you a favor right because it's sort of like i think for each of our volunteers you know we're filling a gap right like we're filling a gap for them in terms of meaning and mission and impact right like given the nature of like we're so early stage at neighbor share etc we're also helping to fill that entrepreneurial scratch right sort of like the hey i want to build something but i'm not going to quit my day job so how do i do that no you can build here be in our little garage together and grind with us and figure things out and we'll fail together and learn together and there's fun and community in that right and then once again like thinking through cleverly about what else you can offer for us we're like hey we have a fantastic board we have a killer volunteer team it's network right we're all here to help each other out we're all here to pay it forward and so in that way it's almost like in that way you can almost in, like you can almost like start creating this like air it's like a little bit extreme but almost like this air of exclusivity like you're lucky that you get to volunteer for us mm-hmm. and the more you can almost like work yourself up to be like yeah like that's how i feel about it people will sense your energy be like i want to be part of that right and then by the way like i think it's totally okay um if a person's like hey and right now i don't have the time Right, like to your point about that conversation when you're like, oh, just join the committee, it's okay. Like, it's like, you know, don't worry about it, just show up, or whatever. Like, one, to your point, that's a fallacy. There's a lot of real work to be done. And then two, like, why would you want to set it up so that you're mismanaging expectations off the bat? Right? Like, I think each of the people we're talking to could probably be pretty clear and upfront about the G's. I can either sign up for this commitment or I can't. And then, you know, and then for me, like, and I do think this is one piece that is different about sort of like the nonprofit volunteer space versus like a for-profit you're paying someone thing. Where for me, like, you know, when I say I'm talking to a prospective volunteer, I might have questions about the, hey, like, will they actually have enough time? Like, is, is that commitment going to be real? We just bring them on. We test them, right? Because it's not like, once again, it's not like for-profit where like we're paying a bunch and blah and all this stuff. It's like, no, just hop on in and we'll test you out. And you'll suss out really quickly, by the way, if that volunteer is super committed, if they have the ability to do the work. And, you know, for us, the way I handle it is like, you know, we keep our standards high and you kind of just roll them off, right? Like, hey, if that's not working out, like, great. Like, thank you. Like, you know, we'd love to see you do this, but then we kind of just move on to the next person until we find the right click. And so it's not some like scary, I'm firing you conversation, but I will essentially roll you off if you're not gonna add value and you're, you're not gonna like, show the level of commitment that our other volunteers do. Cause it's once again about maintaining that high bar. And that's hard for leaders to do. It's hard for leaders who are managing high paid staff to do as well. Yeah. And I don't know what it is, but in, in my long career of being a music director in, in large churches, I had to fire volunteers. And yes. They were Which happy. It's bizarre to it. think about, but it's actually very important. It is, but they were happy because they knew it wasn't working and they felt obligated to keep trying when they knew they couldn't do it or didn't have time to do it, where it wasn't a good skill fit for them. Right. So they were like, oh, whew, I didn't right. know how to tell you that I couldn't do this. So we're actually having that conversation that's value to both sides. Oh, these are really important themes. And we have not talked about this in seven years. So <laughs> You've got you got a pool of candidates, and um, you want to bring them bring them on. So, how do you make sure there's a match for their passions and their skills? Yeah. So, you know, I think, I mean, my approach is actually fairly similar to what I do in my in my um, for profit hat, right? In terms of how I built orgs in the past, where, you know, I think you start first with thinking about what you need. Right. Like we literally have a team org chart. They're all filled by volunteers, but it's a real org chart. We think about the skill sets we need. We think about how much of it we need. And then we go look for it. Right. And then and then you go and talk to the prospective volunteers. You look for that click. And so and then so there's that the what we need side. And then to your point, then it becomes like a very good open conversation with the volunteer on, hey, your skill sets match. But then what are you interested in? Right. And so we also have that explicit conversation where I oftentimes pull up the org chart and say, hey, I'd love to see you here. Like your resume is perfect for it, but let's talk about it. Cause by the way, I need help here, here, and here as well. Right. So let's make sure that we're giving you something that really fulfills sort of, it makes it interesting and exciting, right? Sort of like a volunteering for neighborhood shouldn't feel like a burden. It should be a thing that you're passionate and excited about and you want to do. Right. And so you just have that back and forth and like, and you learn how to be flexible, right? There's some folks who like really match resume wise well with this part of the org, but they really want to try this thing out, this other part out. Right, um, because like that's the thing they want to experiment in. Maybe that's the next career move they want to make, and this is like a safe place for them to experiment with it. And then you give them that space. 
you might say, hey, can you do some stuff that we know your bull side at? Like, you're going to be so good at it. We really need that help. But in the meantime, here's a couple projects in this space too that you're interested in. Let's do that. Let's do both. Right? And so there's like, you learn how to get flexible and creative. And one of my, um, one of my favorite mentors at work, she, she used to use this analogy that I love where she's like, look, like, you know, like every manager, like think of it, like the analogy is like, think of it as like, as a manager, you're managing a basket of fruit, <laughs> right? And then each fruit, each piece of fruit is going to be like, not perfect. Like your, you know, your apple's going to be a little bit bruised, your banana's going to have some spots on it, et cetera. But it's your job as manager to figure out how to make the best damn fruit salad out of that bowl of fruit. And so that's what you do, right? You get creative about which pieces you cut, which pieces you slice, and you pull it together to make the whole thing sing and create something delicious, right? And so that's this is the same thing here in terms of going back and forth and matching and getting volunteers to be both excited about what they're doing while still optimizing for what you need in the organization. So there's a um, there's a motivation thing, and I talk about the most useless things that leaders do, and one of those is motivating people but you create it what you just did creates a way for them to be self-motivated yes if you go rah 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 we got to do this rah rah and they hit the door and it's gone so you've created a system that in that system <clears throat> there's a built-in motivation how do you keep that a recurring process am i hearing you right and how do you keep it going absolutely i think um i, I think you're you're saying it better than i am Hugh. like i think that's spot on and then in terms of, you know, maintaining it, like, I think there's, there's a few different things, right? There's first, which is the thing we talk about, which is like, keep them as owners, right? And keeping it fresh, right? There's like owning the pieces. And then by the way, it's like kind of easy for neighbors to keep it fresh because we're constantly pivoting, right? This worked, this didn't, let's go try the next thing. And so everyone sort of like constantly has a new plate of work and experiments. So it's like the job's never boring, right? So they're sort of like, you know, keeping them excited about the work itself as owners of that work. Um, I think a second piece is really just prioritizing building and nurturing that community and connection, right? And that's been especially important for us because, like, you know, once again, like, our entire existence has been during COVID. We're all remote. I have 30-something volunteers across the country, right? And, like, I... Um, like a bunch of us have never met a bunch. I probably never meet unless I like make it out to Colorado or something like I'm in Connecticut right now. Right. And so it's sort of like, how do you maintain that connectivity and community? Um, and for example, like we actually had our first ever in-person neighborhood holiday event last Thursday and it was magical. Right. It just like, it just, um, it reminded me how like zoom is incredible, but wow, like that in-person getting to meet each other for the first time, board members, advisors, past and present volunteers. It was just like, wow, like this is what it feels like to be together. Right. And so it's like certainly a lesson for myself in terms of like, let's not underinvest in that because every single person, myself included, left that much more motivated, that much more passionate and being like, wow, we are an awesome. This is an awesome group of people. Let's keep on going. Right. So that part's really important. And then there's also like other ongoing techniques. Right. Sort of like, you know, I host a weekly team meeting. Not all our volunteers can make it for those who can't make it. I record it and send it out. But it's like a way to like keep everyone connected. Because once again, remember, you're their fourth, fifth, sixth priority. <laughs> so they're not constantly thinking about you. So keeping them connected. Right. And that was like an early lesson I learned where, you know, for example, we um, in the beginning days, like I kept on losing our volunteer software engineers. And I was like, oh, like it's such important talent. They're a tech talent. They help us build the platform. Like, why do we keep on losing them? And I realized it's because like, in the day to day, like I didn't have an excuse to talk to them, right? Instead, I was actually doing the thing that you said, which is I was like, well, let me not constantly talk to them because that's wasting their precious time. Like, why would I give them an update on this side of the business where it's not really relevant for the code they're building, right? But then what happened was that they became too removed from everything going on and it wasn't as exciting anymore, right? And so once we put in this weekly team meeting where it's like everyone gathered, it doesn't matter what your function is, what your role is, et cetera. Let me give you the broad update, the strategy, what's going on, our wins, our losses, all of that. Everyone just stays connected on the latest right and so you just feel you feel sort of like just as close to that mission as as possible so that was like and it was like interesting was like every quarter so i always ask our volunteers we switch these and monthly bi-weekly am i repeating myself too much and everyone's always like just keep it weekly keep it weekly like we'll join when we can like once again it's like not everyone joins all the time but it's like an important cadence to set um and then you know and last but not least like you know i do think i do think there is an importance as leaders to be a bit of the um of the sort of like the, the recorder on repeat, right? Like this constant reinforcement of the mission, the vision, why we're doing this and our path forward, right? And then making sure we're taking the moments to like celebrate our success together, right? And sharing in that success. Like every single person played a role, even though I was maybe the one who had that really great call, 
but let me share that call. Let me share the details of it. Let me share the feedback from the person I just spoke with, right? So everyone's just in that building. And so those are all sorts of different techniques I've developed to just like keep folks excited about what we're doing. That's priceless. Um, there's, a, there's another dynamic and we just got a few minutes left, but I want to work this in. Um, we as leaders, and I see this across the board and I say we, because I teach this stuff, and I still have the same problems. So we are all human and we err, but it gives us a chance to learn more, right? So right. one of the things we do is over function. We do things that other people can do. And in doing that, we A, rob them, rob them of a chance to fulfill their passion by doing something they showed up to do. And two, we've overextended ourselves and then we had to burn out because there's a limit to how much we can do. So what's your advice, th th this volunteer piece, it's getting them, but also learning to delegate yes. and getting out of the way. Any advice to leaders on any of that? Yeah, I mean, I think that's incredibly important and a really, really critical point. You know, I think the key thing is, um, you know, step one's recognize that you got to delegate, right? Like, there's just no way you can't. Like, it's like, you, you got to do it, right? And so, like, I'm constantly, you know, I have this sort of, like, daily, like, you know, um, it's like a Word document on my computer that I pull up every day. That's, like, my critical do to-dos for the day, right? It always starts with, like, what are my top four to five priorities for the quarter? And I'm just constantly staring at the, like, what are the things that only I can do? Whether it's because I own that relationship or whether, like, you know, it's a thing that's just going to be a big bulk of time that's going to be hard for a volunteer to get their hands into. Like, there's, like, different reasons for why it has to be me. But your reasons for why it has to be you has to be a really high bar, right? Because you can kind of make an excuse and make it all has to be you, but that's just not true, right? So being really, really crisp about that. And then, like, once I tighten that list and it's a constant thinking through, okay, like, where else do I need help, right? And just and, and making the delegation process an explicit one. Right. And so the things I'm constantly pulling up and revisiting is my to do list, the quarterly priorities, which I translate into like monthly to do's for the team. And then I'm also constantly pulling out the org chart. Right. And thinking through where are the places where I feel tight? Where are the priorities where I'm like, oh, like it's going slow and it's all on me. And why is that? Right. Because when it's that something's off, then you go figure out, OK, who else can I pull in? Who else I can help? Where can I break down pieces, et cetera, and just get it off my plate again? Right. Because it's literally like. As a manager, it's much more the job needs to be you're running around spinning plates and keeping them spinning on those sticks. I should be dancing around and keeping them spinning, but I, I can't be holding too many of them myself, right? Because then they're going to drop, right? And so it's sort of like just getting that balance right. And then and like I do, I do think it's much, much more of an art than a science. And I think over time you, you get that feeling right, right? And get that balance right. And then I think there's a bit of the also like listening to yourself, right? Like, are you burning out? Are you paying attention to your own self-care and all of that, right? Because like all of those are signals of like, hey, what you're doing is probably unsustainable. And then the only answer needs to be, I got to delegate more, right? And if that's the case and you're feeling that signal, if you're just tired and you're starting to feel unmotivated or just overwhelmed or whatever, okay, go back to step one. Here are the things I thought that only I can do and here are the rules I made to say that it had to be me. That's probably wrong because like the outcome I'm getting isn't sustainable. Let's revisit. <laughs> what are the rules that shouldn't be rules? And what are the things that really I got to go train up someone else to do, right? And I think it's like a constant cycle. It's a constant ongoing thing. And the right answer now is going to be different from the right answer three months from now. All right. Before your final question, uh, people go to NB, that's yes, for neighbor, neighbor, right? Uh, NB, Nancy Book, NBShare.org. What will they find when they get there? Yeah, thank you. So you'll find a lot of information about how our model works. And then you'll also find a lot of opportunities to just directly help neighbors in need. And, you know, every single profile you read is a is a, a validated person on the ground who has been validated by one of our nonprofit partners and their awesome staff on the ground who can vouch for the fact that this person is real, this need is real. And in fact, this is a need that's at risk of slipping through the cracks. And so you'll find mainly a lot of just really validated opportunities to help someone directly today. Awesome. So what's your advice for uh, other first time founders? I mean, I think, I think the key thing is that the first step is always the hardest, right? But it's like, push yourself to do it. And then by the way, like it doesn't need to be a gigantic momentous step, right? Like neighbor got going because my co-founder called me, it was a 15 minute call. And then by like the end of that 15 minutes, we're like, let's go. <laughs> we just started doing stuff, right? And so like, just do something to get the wheels turning. And then for me, it just started out literally with like, it was like a tiny step. I started with doing some research. <laughs> I started Googling. <laughs> I was like, wait a minute, we have this insight and this idea. 
I, you know, once again, my background's not in the nonprofit space. I don't pretend to be a deep expert on social impact. So like, I just started reading a ton, right? Asking to get connected to folks who do know, et cetera, who can answer my very basic questions and then get going, right? And then, and then depending on the pace at which you want to go. And then by the way, that's another thing where like, there's no right or wrong pace, by the way. Take the next step. Well, Diana Zhang, you've uh, given us a whole lot of good information in a very short period of time. Thank you so much for being our guest on the Nonprofit Exchange today. Thank you so much, Hugh. This is wonderful. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you for watching the Nonprofit Exchange.